Everything is awesome. Yes, it is. This is your pal, Dusty Cat, over here on the fabulous West Coast, San Jose, California. It is 67 degrees and sunny, beautiful day. We got the pinball machines out of the garage to fix them up. You know, we're going to get those things ready to sell because we got things to do with the garage. We need some room. They were great while we had them, but, you know, it's time to move on to other projects. So those are going to get fixed up and move on. And we're going to go see a motorcycle for Nathan. We got all kinds of stuff going on. It's beautiful. I bought my beautiful girlfriend, Amy, a riding jacket for Valentine's Day because you know what? Nothing says loving like making sure your woman is safe on the back of your motorcycle. Trust me. But you're not here. No, you're not here to figure out how much I love my woman. Nope, you're not. I think you're here because we have with us today one wonderful background musician, music guy, he loves to do all that stuff. I mean, without background music in movies and TV, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't feel, you wouldn't feel the scene, would you? You just wouldn't. So with that, I want to introduce to you the man who's been doing it since episode one. That would be Mr. William Anderson. Will. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. afternoon to you, my friend. How are you Thank doing? You. I'm doing good. Awesome. It's been like forever since we talked. How long has it been? I it's do not know. It's been Equestria. Uh, uh, no, it was. Uh, we did talk. Yeah, it was Equestria LA, the second one. Two years. Two years. At least two years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, you you shut everything down. Came down for like half an hour to say hello. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that was the thing. You were still busy doing something. I don't remember what, but he's like, you were there. I, I saw you. I said, hey, Will, how you doing? It's like, I got half an hour, and that's it. I got to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, I have my nose to the grindstone. You're a, busy, you're, you're a popular busy man. Why? Because you're good. Yeah, well, I love being busy. Yes, being busy is good. Being busy pays the bills and gets you toys for the studio. Mm. Mm-hmm. So, hey, um, everybody knows that he does MLP, but he's also done things like Iron Man Adventures. He did... Uh, Background music for VH1 shows back in the day, um, and some other Marvel products. Uh, did I, I'm I'm? Do you do? Uh, I, I did not research this, but do you do uh, Little Pet Shop too? No, uh, oh, okay. I, I did not. I think that was Daniel Ingram's. Okay, so he did the background music too. Yeah. Oh wow. He, he did everything. I'm pretty sure he did everything. Oh, cool. But uh, yeah, I did a bunch of uh, Kids Choice Awards. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Fantastic Four and Iron Man mm -hmm. and Spider-Man, the new animated series, yep. Beethoven, Problem Child. Uh, I just did packages from Planet X for uh, Disney and La La Loopsy for Nickelodeon. And I'm on season five now of My Little Pony, yes. French is Magic. And, you know, I've done a lot of other stuff, too. Oh, absolutely. Lots and tons of stuff. So we're going to start off with our stock question that we ask everybody that comes on the show right now. So what are some of the cartoons and comics you watched or read as a child or are still watching to this day? Okay, going to comics like Printed Page. Yeah. I always loved, uh, I remember Flash, you know, I loved Flash. Flash. Yeah. I loved Batman. Mm hmm And then there were some other older ones. Um, uh, uh, I love Fantastic Four. Mm hmm Um... I remember reading Archie comics. Oh, nice. Yeah, I mean, uh, I loved comic books when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about that in years, but I did. Well, that's great. Awesome. Yeah, you know what? As a writer on Archie comics, how many different ways can you have Archie not go out with either of these two girls? You know, you know? How, <laughs> how many? <laughs> um, what, you know what? Let's, let's talk a bit about the music. What gear are you into these days? What new toy? Have you gotten lately that really that you really love to use in your studio? You know what? I have a strong philosophy about that. Use what you know and understand, and don't always go after the latest, greatest, fastest, newest thing because we are not beta testers. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and so I've been using Digital Performer forever, and you know, I I go to the new versions, and in my studio, uh, looking around it now. Uh, God, I have all the th nicest things. Uh, <laughs> I, I do. Uh, I just got a new keyboard. Oh, it's nice. just It's nothing fancy about <laughs> it. Uh, uh, but the other one just finally wore out. It was a Korg, and now I have a Yamaha, mm -hmm. an SPX90, I believe it is. And it's a, it's a, yeah, I love the action. That's a good, good, good box. Cool. 
cool. And uh, bought a new guitar recently. Yeah. Um, just a classical guitar. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love it. I just went into Guitar Center and had I just had them open up the case, the locked case with all the best guitars in it. And I said yep. I want to play them all. Oh, like, nice. which one's best? The guy didn't know. I said, which one has the best? You know, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, let me go get my manager. Well, this is Guitar and, Center, you know. Yeah, he didn't know. I had Neighbors. no idea. No. Um, and then I'm always looking for great microphones. I love good mics. Oh, yeah. Good microphone. I need to, I need to get a, a good microphone. I'm still using this Blue Yeti thing. Blue is, makes wonderful Blue makes wonderful stuff, right? Yeah. But this is like a USB, you know, basic yeah. microphone that's, for that's what we're doing thing. right now. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds great. I've tried singing through this thing. Eh, it's okay, but it picks up a lot of weird stuff. So yeah. I really need to get a condenser mic with like Mando Pony and start like getting serious. So, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm like, doing next is a nice microphone. Um, what? Here's, here's a question. Almost every music guy I come on, I ask this question. What music is on your phone right now? Oddly, I have to go with the guy who won the Oscar last night, Alexander Desplat. Really? Yeah, I, I, I just think what he writes is so elegant and graceful. And what I've been listening to, and like my, my children, it's not like the latest, greatest thing. His score, it was the Harry Potter score, whatever, for, I think, I don't know, one of the Harry Potter scores. There's <laughs> this thing, it was Lily's theme. Okay. And it is so beautiful. Uh, there's a, I do this every month. Uh, when I'm paying bills and having to just deal with running my music corporations and doing this, and, mm -hmm. and I put it the, that one track, Lily's theme, on loop, okay. and and I will listen to it like 200 times. It'll run for two. I have my whole house wired so it can be on in the bathroom upstairs, in the kitchen, in the living room, <laughs> in my studio, and there's there's buttons and and it'll go. Uh, it'll. I, I must have played. You know, it, I just let it run over and over again because I just think every note is so beautiful. That is well, you're just like me. Yeah. I'm, I, I love orchestral, and I would do the same thing if I had the money. Wire my whole apartment or with the whole stuff. house. <laughs> yeah, we got Screwball in the scene. Hey, Screwy, how you doing, I buddy? I have to jump in on that because, yeah. William, you're, you're so cool. <laughs> yeah. There's our I Screwy. actually did not do that, but I bought my house from a guy who was a, uh, uh, an executive at Warner Brothers. Uh, what? Craig Costin, and he had lived here for 14 years, and he was moving out, but... You know, he was a music guy and had lots of parties up here and, uh -huh. and uh, you know, independent. Uh, he was, you know, you know, like label guy. And, wow. and so he had wired the house uh, when I bought it. it. You know, it's every single room has a button where you can turn it on and I can scroll through radio stations or go to the video or go to my own feed from my laptop. And uh, I just love it. You know, I, I uh, so it was here. I didn't put it in, but that was one of the reasons I bought the house. That's it's so crazy great. crazy awesome. That's wow. amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> um, who, I know I, Screwball is going to love this question. Who are some of your musical heroes in the soundtracks that you really love? Tell us Oh, about yes. Yeah. My, my basic point of view is almost everybody is so darn good. Yes. Uh, uh, and, and so I'm always like, I, I, I'm humble. I'm constantly humbled. And all of the main Hollywood composers, you know, the big top six or whatever, are also good. Alexander Desplat, John Williams, um, uh, Harry Gregerson Williams, uh, uh, James Horner, James Newton. Oh, Mann. yes. I mean, uh, gosh, they're all so good. Um, what, who, was, who, was the, who was the gentleman who did uh, Conan the Barbarian, the original? The one who did it for De Laurentiis. I'm trying to remember if that was, uh, was it James Horner? Somebody's Googling. I, I I'm Googling Google right Google now. It. Google it, buddy. Uh, Conan? Yeah, Conan the Barbarian, the original. Not the Destroyer. I'm thinking of the first... Uh, I don't know if it is James Horner. Oh, no. um... Really famous. Oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, okay, now, I always I always say this name wrong all the damn time. Uh, Basil uh, Polidoris? Oh, yeah, Basil Polidoris. Basil, whatever. Yes, yes, that's it, Basil. I body. love that soundtrack. Oh, my goodness. I can loop that forever. Great I love score, that soundtrack. Great wow. composer. How can you not love How that? How can you not love that? I love that thing. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> and we, we already talked about uh, the Harry Potter soundtrack. Do you have any others that you really, really like? Uh, contemporary music. like I, I like contemporary music, too, and I listen to all the stuff on the radio because I have to... Stay current mm -hmm. and God, who's that guy who has that new hit out now? Take me to the, take me, take me to church. 
Take me to church. It is. Uh, I have no idea who that is. Oh yeah, it's a it's a huge huge hit. Screwball oh. research. <laughs> no, not being the research guy. <laughs> you're now you're my research guy. <laughs> I love mean, Gina Spector. Uh, I love. Uh, you know, I mean, there's so many great artists that I oh, love. Yeah. I, 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 I like a lot of the pop stuff I'm hearing on the radio these mm -hmm. days. I like, I like hip-hop. I like uh, country. I, I just like music. Yeah. I, I think anybody who's, like, in your position or, like, Screwball, we just love music. I mean, it's just, it, it all, it, as long as it touches a chord, it's awesome, you know? So that's why people like certain things like orchestral or punk or rock or whatever. It just depends on the mood. Yeah. You know? I said a lot about orchestral. It hits every mood. Yes, it does. Um, okay, here's here's a question. What do you have a particular piece of music that you that is your favorite, not made by you? Uh, for one of my shows, or just something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of your shows is not made. Uh, not made by you. Um, well, you know what. I loved a lot of the score that I did, and this is many years ago, for Earthworm Jim was a cartoon. Oh, yeah, Earthworm oh, Jim yes. was awesome. Yes. I, uh, I, 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 um, I, I wrote and um, orchestrated and conducted and sang the theme. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a budget for a full orchestra. But the underscore for the show I did with my friend Patrick Griffin. And that was a long time ago, and he, I, you know, uh, I just uh, I learned so much from him when we, uh, we we were you know side by side in my studio all day long. Almost anything we wrote in that show, I I, I think it was great, and I would have to say that I was learning from him more than he was learning for from me. Wow, that is awesome. Um, here, here's here's a question. Now everybody knows that you know Warner Brothers has taken Bugs Bunny on the road, right? And they've done the orchestral thing with that with big theater pictures with an orchestra pit and everything. Do you think that Hasbro could do that with like some of its shows like MLP or thing, you know, things like that? I don't know. I mean, uh, it just depends on how large the fan base is and how successful the uh, franchise is mm -hmm. and, and how important the music is. I, I think that a lot of the, all those things are bubbling in there like this could happen. And especially if we, you know, if we did a concert with the, that you also had, uh, you know, like a, a bunch of Daniel songs, which oh, was, yeah. Some, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. it, 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 it might be something really nice. Oh, yeah. I, I, I can see it now. Uh, My Little Pony on Ice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. My Little Pony Hollywood Bowl. There you go. My Little Pony on the Hollywood Bowl. L.A. Philharmonic. Yes. And, uh, you know, Daniel Ingram and William Kevin Anderson conducting. There you go. Done. Yeah. Hasbro, get on it. I just yeah. gave you another great idea, Fun and I'm not, you're not even paying me. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> one of your credits, one of your IMDb credits is The Weird Al Show, which was the, sh the sh variety show we had for kids on Saturday mornings. Yeah. Right? Now, so, yes. the, the question is, did you do background music for that also, or were, is that just because you were in his band at the time you guys were playing? No, actually, I was done being in the band by then. Oh, okay. I was already in, on to uh, my own, like, you know, career as uh -huh. a composer and doing well. And uh, he got a deal to do 13 episodes of a variety show with CBS. Mm -hmm. And I remember the company. It was Dick Clark Productions. DC, yeah. yeah. And uh, I can't remember the executive's name, but they were fumbling a little. They were having some trouble with the music and... You know, and they called me in, and I nailed it. And uh, and I, of course, I know Alan played in his band and recorded with him, and he's a friend. And we just went through the whole thirteen episodes, and I did all the sort of incidental and underscoring music mm -hmm. for the show. Wow, that is awesome. That's that's really cool. I just sent him. I get. I still get royalty statements, oh, really? and some of them are like Weird Al show ten cents. I'm serious. <laughs> Ten cents, or like a little line of plays in Bulgaria, or wherever it is, and I go and I, uh, I take a screenshot and I send it to him, and I, yeah, Al, you know, I'm making I, big bucks. I think know, one, I just, one <laughs> of the actors, I think one of the actors from UHF actually did that in the VH, uh, the VH1 thing on Weird Al Yankovic. He said, "I'm still getting residuals." He had a residual check for a penny. You know what? That movie was amazing and it ahead was. of its time. Yes, way ahead of its time. It's and funny the cast. now. The cast, all those guys went on to be huge, huge stars. stars. 
that that movie was way ahead of his time. He was he's one of those guys that's way ahead of the of the of the clock. I mean, look at look at what he did with the latest album, right? I know. Do you know all that the videos all- are done? Get them out in a week. He did all those videos himself. This was not the idea of no. some PR machine that he was worked with them. He, 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 that was all his idea, all of his ideas, yeah. all of his relationships with different vendors and, and, and production companies he's worked with yeah. you know, for many years. It was his whole idea to do the Blitz and release it all. Biggest record ever was yeah. the result. First number one comedy album since whatever the yeah. 60s. I feel like I'm a booster for Al, but I am. He's he a is. wonderful guy. He's a wonderful guy. And, uh, I wish and I could have him on the show, but you know, get through his people. Pfft. Yeah, right. Um, okay. <laughs> but I could probably get him on the show with you, but not for an hour and a half. Not for an hour and a half, probably. <laughs> he doesn't have that kind of time. Um, okay, so you also did background music for Equestria Girls, Rainbow Rocks. Yes. Um, not only that, the shorts leading up to it, all those those six shorts. Um, how hard? And I think we we talked this, about this before on panels, but how hard? was it to mix into all those different types of songs? You go from the bass heavy under our spell to the hard driving awesome as I want to be to, you know, all these different types of pop songs. So how hard is it to meld what you're doing into what Daniel's doing? You know what? Um, it couldn't, it, it just has to flow and make sense and be smooth and you know I always get through it Mm -hmm. and then I do what I call my comb through I keep pressing relentlessly forward and then I'll go back and look at it after a day when I'm like four five six seven eight minutes farther down the line and I'll see how it sets up and plays out of it Um, uh, and it, it, it's it's not hard because sometimes after a big bass heavy uh, you know kind of dark song mm-hmm. it's nice to have the relief in the score bring them somewhere else you don't want them to get leaden or boring so you you want arc mm-hmm. uh, um, so yeah it's, it just should be smooth and continuous and consistent that's cool um, also you worked on one of my very favorite shows from the eighties I'm sure you can I'm sure you can pick this one. Biker Mice from Mars. How could you even know about Biker Mice from Mars? What are you talking about? I'm a it biker, my, and I'm a, I'm a cartoon geek. It, it was, how do you think I don't know about Biker Mice from Mars? It's the greatest song. It, it was my first hit series. It, it, that series was awesome. Yeah, I loved it. And, and that, that was where I learned everything. I, knew, I, had, I, I heard Danny Elfman say this once about some film he did early on. I had no right being a composer and, and, you know, and doing this film. I had no idea what I was doing. Mm-hmm. That's where I was at. Basically, I'm Biker Mice from Mars. Yeah. Uh, and I just learned it on the ground. And it was so, it's great not having a bunch of preconceived notions about how things work. Yeah. Uh, I just made it work. Uh, yeah, that was a fun show and, and a great theme. A, a yeah. perfect, perfect Biker Mice from Mars theme. It, it, was the sa- it was the same kind of show as SWAT Cats, right? Yes, exactly. Was, SWAT Cats and Biker Mice from Mars were sort of victims of the times. They were both pretty violent, right? Yeah. And yeah. parents didn't want violent cartoons at that time. So they basically were, you know, they were popular, but as soon as the violence came in with the rockets and all this other kind of stuff, the parents said, whoa, 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 whoa. It was sort of like what happened to Thundar. Yeah. Back in the day. Thundar was a little too edgy. For the 70s. And then Biker Mice from Mars and SWAT Cats got a little edgier in the 80s, but then they said, well, we're not ready for that yet. And, I, and it ended. It, it actually, after I got that show, I, I've never had an agent or been represented by anybody, and I've, I've always just gone job to job based on doing a good job and mm-hmm. making my deadlines and not having an attitude. And, right. And, uh, that, that, and so that actually was the first hit. And since then, I've just been doing so much animation. I, I remember Rick Unger was the creator of that. Uh-huh. I, I had just done a job for Mike Young and, uh, called uh, PJ Sparkles, and he was hanging out with him. And he had, he, 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 I don't know if this is boring or not. He was actually, uh, and I don't know if this is wrong from this. Anyway, he was like smoking weed and getting high. Oh, and he like, I want to do something as cool as... Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and he came up with the idea of Biker Mice from Mars. And there we go. That's how, that's how hit shows are made, people. You know what? That's, uh, anyway, that's, then I... Or, I, 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 I wonder if that's how Sid and Marty Croft came up with Lidsville. You know what? One wonders how One much. Wonders. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, moving on. Then, then comes it, talking about, you know, what you take to make the right shows. Um, Coconut Fred's Fruit Salad Island. 
Um, okay. Yeah, it's like, and Ashley Balls talked about this show, and I've actually never seen an episode of it, but I probably should. Um, a lot of tropical themes in this one, I would think. Um, how hard is it for you to jump from genre to genre to genre in music? You've done pop, rap, a little bit of metal. Now, in this kind of show, you'd probably have to do with some tropical jungle theme type music. Um, how hard is it for you to jump from theme to theme to theme? It's not hard at all. It's the greatest thing about the job is to, what, one of the most, like we were talking earlier, how it's about the film and the, and the show and the dialogue, and that's, that's what you have to create. And so, like, for any animation show, you want a signature sound. You, you, want, you want to do something that, that becomes endemic with the, with the show and is part of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and Coconut Fred, uh, Rob Paulson's a very famous voiceover guy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He he was a he was a voice he voiced uh, Coconut Fred and he actually has said that it's the worst show he's ever done, um, <laughs> and that was the only one he's ever been that he was really actually embarrassed about. I believe. Oh my goodness! He well, yeah. When Ashley Ball said she she actually did a uh, a gender a gender confused tomato. That's yeah. Funny. I was like, that makes me want to go watch it. Actually, <laughs> I, like, I I I I thought what we did with the music. I did uh, I did like punk ukulele stuff. Nice. I now I've got to see it. Yeah, no, it was good. I had my friend Kimo, uh, Jim West. He's in Weird Al's band. I go, come over with your ukulele, uh -huh. and 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 let's do some punk rock on it and play some like blues riffs. Nice. And, uh, that must have been fun. and yeah, it was fun. It was fun. I love doing punk ukulele. Is what we ended up calling it. <laughs> hey, screwball. Uh, yo, <laughs> he's off eating something. I think. No, I was. Uh, I had to find an unmute mic. <laughs> had to find the unmute mic. I do a hey, lot of typing. I, I know you had. You wanted a couple of questions for this gentleman because you're a huge fan. Yes. Uh, what I have to ask you is, um, what's your most? I, I, what's what's your most favorite composer out there? From I, like from like movies to just your basic albums to TV anything, uh, is there is there is there one that just stands out for you more than any other? Well, there's three or four giants. Uh, you know, John Williams, uh, James Newton Howard, James Horner, Alexander Desplat, and I, I really don't. There's not there's not one guy for me. I, I'm just so in awe of so many people's talent. But those are like I would go. I mean, those top four. Those would be my top four right there. Cool. That's so good. Mm -hmm. uh, here's another one for you. What's your most favorite instrument? <laughs> Piano. Piano. Yeah. Yes. Piano. Yes. I'm a, yeah. I'm a cello guy myself. I love. Cellos. You know, it's a percussion <laughs> instrument. Oh, yeah. absolutely, it is. Yeah. yeah. If 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 you didn't think it was a percussion instrument, watch Elton John play it. It's, it's oh my percussion. god, yes. Yeah. John Elton John would break fingers. Yeah, like, he's a he's a pounder. He's a pounder. Yeah, I, I saw a, uh, I saw something on with him, where he said early in his career that the PA systems weren't that great, right? They didn't know how to mic pianos. So basically, to play with a band in like Sydney Opera House, he had to pound on the damn thing, and he yeah. was he would he'd lose four pounds a show because he's like sweating so pounding <laughs> on the damn thing. Crazy. Well, Elton John, I grew up to. I used yes. to always listen to him. Same with Billy Joel. I love um, Joel. And I don't know what sparked my orchestral um, like thing. It just came out of nowhere, and it just like next thing I'm just getting album after album from like movies, TV shows, and I started getting into Two Steps from Hell, which is my most favorite um, uh, band out there right now that does orchestral music. Cool. Yeah. yeah, I've got I've got one for for Will. If there was one band in all the world you wanted to see live, who would that be? Like right now. Like right now, the band. How about this? How about any band from now back to all bands you knew, even bands that are broke up. You know, if you were a young man and you wanted to go see a band in the '60s, what band? in all of your want and need and love, would you love to see? God, I've seen them all. Uh, I can't think of one that I missed. Uh, really? Yeah, and I'm trying to think of like a, um, like when American Idiot was a huge hit. I saw that concert tour and Billy Joel Armstrong and those guys just killed it. I mm -hmm. love that. Um, I'm trying to think, who would I want to see right now? 
Um, Hmm. Like you know what I, I'm I'm really fumbling for an answer. You know I'm I'm gonna go with I'd love to see Regina Spector. There you go. Wow, that's a good answer. I just think she's so brilliant and yeah. effortlessly a prodigy, and and says exactly what's on her mind. Mm -hmm. Yet doesn't sound pretentious, but is still very smart. And I, I've never seen her, and I wonder what she performs like. That'd be cool. That'd be cool. Not a big star. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you one band you should see. If they, if they go on tour again, which is my good friend Mick Collins' band, The Dirt Bombs. If you like... <laughs> the Dirt Bombs. The Dirt Bombs. Okay. Because they play Detroit... They are the grandfathers of Detroit Garage Punk. Yeah. And get this. Two drums, two bass, and a lead guitar. That's insane. It is. And it's awesome. It's great. I've seen them live like four times, and every time they blow out the back of the wall and you're dancing your butt off. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. If you ever, if the Dirt Bombs tour again and come to L.A., you must go see them. I will. If you... they, were, they were nominated in the top 25 live bands by Rolling Stone about five years ago. Wow. Yeah. You should see them. Um, yes, I love the Dirt Bombs, and yes, I love my friend Mick Collins. I will continue to talk them up. Mm. It's my show. Um, so... Let's see. Um, any other questions I got here on this list? Uh, okay, here's here's a good one. Who would be the one music person in the whole world that you would love to play with? Okay, yeah. these are hard questions. They are. They <laughs> are questions. Um, I was trying to come up with interesting things. Who are you talk about? Right now, I'm gonna say Pink. Oh, really? Yeah. She is kind of crazy out there, isn't she? I'm writing songs right now, just my own stuff. Mm -hmm. And everybody hears it goes, Pink would sing this so well. And I wish that, you know, she could come over and we could share a bottle of wine. I could sit at the piano and we could just sit down and, and play through these songs and see if they, they hit her. Wow. That would be cool. Yeah, no. That would be awesome. That is sweet. Okay, so one more question before we go talk about some other stuff, which is conventions and charity. So one more question. Now, I know we talked earlier before the show that you did not watch last night's Oscars. I didn't watch it. I was watching something else. But in Os the Oscar for orchestral or for a movie, music, really, it's highly political, highly political about that. Your thoughts on music that usually wins an Oscar. Does it deserve it? Do you think there's usually other music that should be thought about for an Oscar? That, but it usually goes to the popular movie. What are your thoughts? I find the Academy to be so incredibly lame about their vo votes on Oscars for best score that I am, uh, it's hard for me to watch the show. Yes. Uh, if they, they, they often just, whatever the movie of the year is that brings all the awards, the score for it inevitably wins as well mm -hmm. uh, too many times. Last night, Justice was served when Alexander, I don't know what, Alexander Desplat was up for two movies. I don't know which one he won for. It doesn't matter. It was Selma. Yeah. It, 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 he, he deserved that Oscar, and he's so darn good. Uh, and I'm not going to bash on other composers in the past that have mm -hmm. went, when they have won. I've just went, you have, you're joking me. This guy can't write his way out of a paper bag. Uh, yeah. And, and generally, it's the composers, uh, you know, sometimes directors are enamored of pop stars or rock stars, mm -hmm. and they hire them because they, to, to write the scores for their films in the Academy, or people, they, they think that it's cool, but to me, it's like emperors in new clothes, I, uh, emperor, you know, the emperor without any clothes, you know, mm -hmm. I, it's like everybody just thinks that it's so good, and... and but anybody who knows how to score films or, or does it for a living, mm -hmm. it, you know, listening to the score, it's just like, oh, my God, you know, this yeah. is terrible. And, and he just won a friggin' Oscar. Yeah. I'm shutting the TV off. How, how about this one, then? I'll, I'll, I'll bring you back. Did you ever see the Rankin-Bass, The Last Unicorn? No, but I like Rankin-Bass. Okay. The, the, the rock band America did the music for that movie. It, to me, is awesome. They did the background music, they did the actual rock music, the interstitials, everything. And I think that they did a great job. But I would really love to have your opinion about it. Because, it's, again, it's not, it was done in the 1970s when America was huge. Huge band. 
right? But it's like, and the only the only way you could get that soundtrack was actually to order it out of Germany. Mine says Das Eisen Utikon on the on the cover because I had to get the German version. And beautiful, beautiful soundtrack to me. But I'd love to hear your your opinion about it someday. Well, I think that the score and songs were composed and arranged by Jimmy Webb and not the group America. But oh, they okay. Had, okay. and they just they just performed the stuff. Oh, okay. Then I was I was mistaken. I'm sorry. No, the band America performed them all. But look, you've got a guy who's a, a who's a you know mm -hmm. an amazing composer and songwriter at the helm. Oh, okay, good, awesome. Then I, I was mistaken on on where it went. I didn't know that he was behind that. Yeah, they didn't write any of the songs. My bad. Sometimes I do get it wrong. I'm not perfect. Okay. But, yeah, I, I am such a huge fan of that movie. But, um, okay. So, with that, I think we're going to talk convention season. Because it's all, it's all breaking now, people. Because we just had PonyCon New York City. And that went off huge from what I hear. Lots Tell of fun. Tell me about it. I yeah. know nothing about it. Was it a big success? I hope so. It was so. a big success. They had, like, Two or three hundred more people this year than they had last year. Um, they had Vincent Tong was there doing dance stuff. They had Andrea Lidman there. It was awesome. Daniel Ingram was, was that, there. Yeah, good. Yeah, so everybody was there. It was a great time. Everybody seems to have had a great time at the first one of the year. So we move on to BabsCon. BabsCon's coming up April 3rd to 5th, and the guest list is huge. Um, Kathy Westluck, Tara Strong, Daniel Ingram, Stephen Andrews also, Claire and Ian Corlett, Brian and Brenna Drummond, Andrea Libman, Marika Hendricks, Peter New, GM Barrow, Heather Neufer, Bobby Curtinow from the comics, Rebecca Soyshet, Natasha Levenger, me, everybody is going to be there. It's going to be awesome. Um, so you should check that out. Um, we got lots of things are happening. Some more things are happening. I've trust me. Watch my channel for the next couple of weeks because stuff's going to happen. It's going to be awesome. That's in April, you said. That is in April. That is Easter weekend. April 3rd to 5th. Absolutely, nice. yes. And then that's right here in San Francisco. San Francisco, right here. Then, Everfree Northwest, May 29th to 31st. They moved May 29th to 31st. Guests, John Delancey, Nicole Oliver, Tabitha St. Germain. Those are the three we know for sure. Um, they're taking donations for the charity auction, so go to everfreenw.com slash charity for a donation form. If you want to give something to the donations for that. Uh, panel submissions. Panel submissions for that con end March 16th. So if you want to do a panel for Everfree Northwest, get your panel in there. Um, I have been, I might, we're talking, maybe, I'm going to be there anyway, but things may happen. Um, BronyCon. Of course, that's the end of the summer. we got lots of stuff between, but BronyCon, the big one, August 7th to 9th, 2015. Just announced guests. Amy Keating Rogers, Kasumi Evans coming back. With the current roster, Heather Neufer, Andrea Libman's coming back, Agnes Grabowski from the comics, Nicole Oliver's coming back, Tony Fleece is coming back, Daniel Ingram's coming back. They need this guy, William Anderson. Is that the one in Los Angeles? No, that is the one in Baltimore. Baltimore. The big one. The huge one. It's the one that, that's the big one. That's I didn't the know. the big one. The big yeah. one. Equestria LA is coming back at Labor Day weekend. Equestria LA is coming back. They're still, they got a website. It's up there. You can go check it out. Guests have not been announced yet. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be there, but I'm just going to go because I'm me. Because it's in California. I'm not going to, I'm not going to miss it. I've made every one. I love them. So I love the people down there. We're going to, we're going to make it done. So Equestria LA, Labor Day weekend is also going to happen. Tons that's of, also happening. That's just the big ones. ones. That's not the little ones in your little regional area. That's just the huge ones. Okay. Regionals going on everywhere. So yeah, if, if you, Go to any of the PonyCon websites with all the... I mean, there's hundreds of PonyCons everywhere, all over the you, world. You know what? I could probably manage... Like I told you, I don't have an agent or a yeah. PR guy, yeah. and, and I'm just in my studio working. And, yeah. and right now, I'm booked all the way through December. <gasps> wow! <laughs> I mean, just with my little pony stuff. Um, yeah, because you got Equestria Girls 3. Yeah, yeah, I got the next movies Equestria there. Equestria Girls 3, uh, Season 5. Got to finish that up. I'm seven shows into that. Seven, there's se only seven of 26. Yeah, and 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 then there's some more, you know, there's some um, more stuff that we can't talk about. Exactly. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. 
Yeah, and and you know that's I think yes. looking at I mean it's like it's like it's crazy. You know, I I have to get a potty pass from now you know just yeah. to go to the restroom just until December so it's just a bummer you know Daniel writes all the songs in advance yeah. and then we animate to him so he's pre-production yeah. and he can go out and be a star and he is a star, he is a star. and and uh, but but I cannot you know what Equestria L A is like across town from you though that's what something I might be able to do. <clears throat> So, we need to talk to Equestria LA to get you out there, because we need you at least one of these things. I know. I'm so... I want to do it. If I come down and have coffee or, or, or juice with Josh Haber, I'm going to call you. Yeah, you're and, welcome and we'll, to come we'll, as my guest to my house and see my studio and hang out. Cool. Yeah. I think I may do that. But anyway... Good time here in LA. Yes, good time here in LA. Um, right. So, with that, that is convention season. So, again, little, little shows, get me some information, I'll track you down, we'll talk about you guys... As you're coming up, give me like two weeks before your show and we'll talk about you. So, Dusty at manlysbury.com, give me some info. Charity time. Charity time. So, last show, which was only two weeks ago, we had Amy Keating Rogers and her daughter Mo talking about Fund Arts Now, which is the LA County High School for the Arts, which is the school that Mo goes to. They were extremely short on their budget for things that they can do. So we said, yes, we're going to help. And we started raising the funds for them. And not only our little two-week thing got 821 bits just for that, right? But a bunch of people made a bunch of stuff that Amy put up on eBay. And those pieces brought 2,177 bits. So together, we did almost three. So $3,000 went between the two. Awesome job, guys. Thank you very much for your help. I'm sure Mo is, is ecstatic with the help that you guys have come up with. So with that, I've got this stuff here that we're going to be giving away. Not these ponies here. These are mine. These came from the Czech Republic from friends of mine. These are from really cool kids' magazines that they sent me, which came with ponies. These are in Czechoslovakian, so I can't even read them, but they're awesome. So, these are cool. Thank you very much, by the way, for sending those to me. So, over here we have a Thai Twilight Sparkle without wings. Can't get those anymore. You've got the Rainbow Dash book signed by GM Barrow. You've got the Twilight Sparkle Secret Ship Fic Folder card game card with my mustache on it. <laughs> you've, got, you've got the vinyl collectible of Discord from Little's Toy Company, our sponsor... Yes, we do have a sponsor now, Little's Toy Company. So you go to their website and you can get anything you want for your collection. And this signed Penny Royal Academy by M.A. Larson. Plus this collectible Luna, which is over here. And not only that, but because we broke 500 bits, Amy is sending me a Two Sisters diary signed, which will also go to you. If I select your name out of this hat, Right here, my favorite hat. Look at all these names, people. Look at all that. You guys did awesome. I was cutting pieces of paper for like an hour to get all these names in this hat. I'm going to pick this one right here. La -da 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 -da. Frank Milligore. Frank Milligore, you are the winner of this wonderful prize package. Right there. I should talk in my TV voice because we're doing TV. In the wonderful prize package, Frank, you win today. So, I'll get all that stuff out to you, Frank. Can you get me your mailing address to Dusty at And we'll get it out there, just like that. Thank you again to Little's Toy Company, our sponsor. Okay, and so we're going to move on. Now, this is a wonderful, wonderful, huge charity. I'm going to spend a little time on this one because it's one of my favorites. Okay. So, Will, let me pick this one. Thank you, Will. I love you. Okay. Um, Riders for Health. Okay. If nobody knows what Riders for Health is, I'm about to tell you. Medicine. Medicine is life. In the most immediate and meaningful sense of the word, medicine is life. All the scientific advantages of the world don't mean diddly squat if you can't get the medicine to the people. Right? If you can't get the medicine to the people, it don't mean jack. So, these guys... Take your donations, and they buy motorcycles and parts for the motorcycles and teach doctors and other people in Africa how to ride the motorcycles to get the medicine to the people in the rural areas of Africa. It has been going on for years. It is awesome. 
It started in England. It's here in America. It's really, really cool. The motorcycles can get in and out of Civil War areas. They can get the medicine to the people when the people need it. I love this thing. Um, all kinds of people are in on this. Um, Ian McGregor is a spokesperson for this. The person, the person who oversees this, okay, is Her Royal Highness Princess Anne of England. Okay, Princess Anne, a real princess, actually oversees this charity. How good is that? Not only that, not only does she oversee it, this is, this is Princess Anne. Her Royal Highness is the president of the International Equestrian Federation, the FIFA of horses. So, you know what that means? This charity right here is run by 100% real life equestrian princess. I'm not kidding. Okay, this, these people do wonderful, wonderful things. They spend like over 80% of everything you give them on the motorcycles, the medicine, and the people. Everything. This is wonderful. I love this one. I hope you guys love it. I, I can't say any more about it. I love it. So for that, hopefully you go to manthesebrony.com, click on the link, give a couple of bits to them for everything that they need. Gasoline, tires, spokes, chains, new motorcycles. Everything. So, hopefully that you will do that. For that, if you go over there to manlessburn.com and give us anything, right? I've got a couple of things for you here. So, we've got another Nurse Red Heart. Nurse Red Heart. I know you guys can get them anywhere, but i got a few of these, so we're going to throw that in there. I found this at Target, which is kind of cool. Sticker by number crystal masterpiece. So, basically, it's a sticker set that you put on this little wood block, and it makes a makes a picture, which is kind of cool. I thought, eh, why not? That's kind of cool. Those two things, plus our sponsor, Little's Toy Company, right there, is giving you these three, which is Twilight, Rainbow Dash, and Pinkie Pie in Christmassy necklaces, or, or neckerchiefs, and hats. So those three will also go to you, plus eh, anything else I got laying around. So mm -hmm. I, I'll, I'll put in there. But... If we break five, call them 500 bits. I really hope we do. If we don't break 500 on this one, I'll be disappointed. But 500 bits, then Will is going to throw in something. What do you think, Will? You know what? I would love to throw in something. And, and uh, when you hit 500, I'll throw in 100 of my own and take us to 600. Woohoo! And uh, I have a, you know, there's a, a wonderful piece of art that a, an artist in Thailand did. He made a caricature of me as a, as a pony sitting at my piano, and it says, your work never fades into the background. And it shows me with my glasses on, looking at music, and I have a cutie mark of a music, a staff and a note on, on it, and my cup of coffee on my piano. Yeah, and it's and in my... the one I've got up on the screen right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll autograph a nice 8x10 glossy of it and send it to whoever. That is awesome. Uh, not only are we going to get 100 bucks from Will, but you're going to get an 8x10 glossy of this wonderful piece of art signed by Will Anderson, who, I'm sorry, is too busy to go to places to sign stuff for you. So it might be the only time you get Will Anderson's autograph. So if you want to give a couple of bucks, you have a chance of getting Will Anderson's autograph, one of the rarest of the rare things in My Little Pony fandom collecting. Mm -hmm. so, and on top of that, one for five, Care to Win, will also kick in 100 bucks if we hit 500 bucks. So that's $200 bonus right there. If we hit five, we're going to seven. Just like that. And I think that's awesome. Thank you very much for that, Will. My pleasure. Absolutely. So with that, we are done with our charity work for the week. And you guys are awesome. We do it every week. I love you. Love you out there. Now we bring in our wonderful, wonderful, happy screwball Happy. Happy Screwball. Yeah, I'm pretty happy. Yep. <laughs> I'm ha you know why I'm happy, Screwball? Why? Because this is my one every, once every two week cider. Oh. <laughs> because I'm, I'm trying to get down to playing weight. So basically I've had to, you know, take things out of my life for a while. You gotta spoil yourself at some point, But right? yes, but every two weeks, every show I get to have one. One. So, I'm actually 245 this week, so I'm That's good. Really well. Yes. I'm, I started at 266. Mm. Hmm. So I'm uh, I'm doing very well. Almost there. Got a few. Got got most of the pieces for my cosplay done. I've got like one more thing I'm waiting for. Got to put some things together, and then the cosplay is ready to go. 
for BabsCon. So excited about this one, guys. I might drop a couple more hints on Twitter of what I'm doing, so I don't keep, even know what keep it an is. eye out. Yeah, <laughs> He doesn't even know what it is. I don't even tell Screwball. Yeah. So screwy. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure our wonderful studio audience is uh, got plenty of questions for this gentleman. Yes, um, I'll bring the first one for Red Card. For you, William, um, how long does it take uh, to compose an episode and how difficult is it? Animation scoring is the hardest thing in the business. Um, you, we, uh, when I started, you used to get two weeks. Now it's a week. Wow. And, um, it's, it's, it's a 50 hour week, and it's, it's a. Uh, the process, you have to get what's, uh, you know, you get, a, you get the locked print, which is the same thing that's on the air. It's the same thing that they mix and do the additional dialogue recording and effects to it. It's like the, the final edit. Because the score has to really just wrap around the very final edit with all the commercial breaks in it. And so my process starts with a, a conference call, Skype call, with uh, Jason and Jim, the directors. And we go through every, every scene of the film and talk about what the music is, what the role of the music is, is it big, is it small, is it here, is it not, is it this, is it that. And then um, we get through the score. And, and then I lay the whole score back to, to video with the dialogue in it and send those guys a movie. And they, they look at it and they give me a page of notes, you know, like, this is good, Will, you're a genius. Will, what were you thinking? Why did we hire you? Uh, <laughs> Are you kidding? Uh, or and um, uh, and and I make the changes and 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 uh, then then we go to a Pro Tools file which is resolved to the time code and has all the different stems on it that goes to the post production house which is Dick and Rogers up in Vancouver mm -hmm. and and then they they mix it and generally it's relentless week after week. This this year I've got a couple of spaces here and there. Um, like a week off here and there, but you know it's like being at war. And once you get through the 26 uh, episodes for this or, or whatever other series, it, it's it's um, then you go through what I call post-project dislocation syndrome, <laughs> uh, which I imagine in a small way it's I, I liken it uh, to uh, it's like being a soldier without a war. Yikes. You know, it's like you're out, I'm out on the street, you know, your phone stops ringing, the show's over, everything's done, and you're so used to working so hard and getting phone calls and doing stuff last minute and still trying to stay fresh and stay on top of it and always do your best work. And then all of a sudden there's this like big, you're in the void of like, oh my God. And it um, takes a couple of weeks to get out of that. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Let's compose something. Yeah. It takes a, it, so it's a week. I get a, I get a week to do it. Wow, cool. Holy cow. Wow. <laughs> Next. Busy guy. Um, uh, so this one's from Waveform to you, William. Uh, in, your opinion, in your opinion, what makes for good slash effective background music? There's so many things, but one thing that comes to mind is you serve the picture and the dialogue and the story. Uh, so you want to tell the same story. And, and uh, sometimes it's really important to be invisible. Like, say you watch the whole scene and it's working and you don't really notice the music, that's good. Um, because if you drop the music out, it would be pretty dull. Um, so being invisible, being subtle, being right under dialogue, hitting the right points of the story, billboarding the uh, important scenes, you know, really hitting the stuff that's important, um, those are the things that makes a good score. Awesome. That's really good. Wow. I, I don't know if you know this, there, there Will, but people have actually taken episodes and, and basically ripped out the background music, and they put them up on YouTube just to listen to the background music. I know. I've been doing this for a long time, animation scoring in films and yeah. other TV shows, and nobody's ever done that before, and, and it's kind of unsettling. I, I used to love going out there and looking at it and stuff, but, and I know they're doing it, and, and it's wonderful that people love the music, and I think it's, it, I, you know, I'm really proud of what we've done for the show, and, and I'm glad people listen to it. Uh, but, oh, yeah. Still my most favorite um, one you've, you've done um, was way back in season two finale uh, with uh, Cadence and Shining Armor um, defeating Chrysalis. That music that you did there just gives, just floods my whole body with chills, and it's just, uh That was probably one of my most favorite pieces that you've ever done. 
That's a good. Uh, that was a show. Uh, that was the end of season two. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah, end of season two. Yeah, yeah. Those. Yeah, that was. That was. That was a. Yeah. It was great. Those were two great episodes. It was a two-parter, right? right. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah, you did a good job with the whole show. Very well done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is from Spike Farming. Uh, question for Mr. Anderson. Uh, how was it uh, reuniting with your old friend? I don't know the story behind this. <laughs> I don't know what the question means. Uh, uh, yeah. He's probably talking about Al. It must be Al. Yeah. I, I, I don't understand the question. Well, well basically, when Al came back on, when Al actually did a character on the show, right, he did Cheese Sandwich. Um, I don't know if you had any contact with Al at that time, because he was basically doing vocals for, David, or for, uh, for Daniel, right? Where Daniel, right. Daniel and, and uh, Andrea sang the song. So I'm not sure you actually had any contact with no, I actually had, but I had a lot to do with making that happen. Yeah, you did. As a matter of fact, you got you got a little bit of the story there. Yeah, no, I do. Uh, it was always uh, Jason and I were talking about. It. Uh, I can't remember if it was my idea or his. I think it might have been mine. I think it was. Uh, I said, you know what, Weird Al is a perfect guy to come do some characters for the show because both of the audiences, uh, you know, his fan base and My Little Pony fan base are kind of like unique their own individuals and and kind of like a little bit out of the ordinary and i thought it would be a nice cross pollination i mean i think that my little pony fans probably like weird al and mm -hmm. weird al fans probably like the show and 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 jason thought it was a good idea and so i i, I talked to al about it and and this uh, this was after i found out gr shows kind of becoming a big hit and al mm -hmm. said you know what i'd love you know that sounds like a great idea and so I told uh, Jason that I thought I could make things happen, mm -hmm. and then I went to go talk to Al. He was playing down at Irvine. You know, they sold yeah. out the 18,000 yeah. seat theater down there, and I went to go see him and talk to him about it, and his manager. That's right, I had to talk to Jay Levy about it, and, mm -hmm. and he was for it, and said that, that for, you know, to be in touch with so-and-so, I can't remember his agency, whatever, call mm -hmm. so-and-so, and so I got all that information back to Jason, and and put and put Jason. I go, you know, call call Al and talk to him about, you know, his what what kind of character you see him doing in the show. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember Jason saying, "I can't call him. He's too big a star." And I go, "No, he's just a normal guy." Mm -hmm. And he is the nicest, normalest guy. And and but Jason, you know, really loves Al. And mm -hmm. uh, and uh, but you know, he called, talked to him. It, it happened. The deal was made. Uh, Daniel ended up, uh, you know, writing the songs for that episode. And. Um, uh, you know, came out really well. I'm, I'm glad I could, you know, help sort of like put the deal together. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, sometimes these things in these shows are like that. You got to have some sort of back back door thing to get certain big names on certain shows. Somebody's got to know somebody. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, you know, probably would have happened without me. I'm not saying that I was instrumental, but you know what? I made it easy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did a good job at it. I loved that episode. <laughs> it's like a musical through the whole thing. I hear noises. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you know why? Because my mare just got home. Give me, give me some sugar, baby. Give me some sugar. Mare. My woman. Nice. Hey, Amy's here. <laughs> nice, Amy. Yes, Will says hello. Hello, Will. Hi. Yes. So she just got home from work. <laughs> so, next. Ah, so this one. Let's see here. Uh, sorry, I, 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 I was so zoned out there. Um, uh, okay, so for, for the show that you worked with Al, uh, for Al's show, um, to William, uh, did you write the theme song or was it Al? No, I, I remember that was Al's show, uh, Al's theme song. Of course he would write his own theme song. Yeah. It was good, wasn't it? I remember yeah. it. Yes. Good. Yeah, it was. It was I, th really... I think the best character in that whole show was the guy boarded up in the wall. <laughs> yes. I, 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 on a kids' show, guy boarded up in the wall. How the heck did he get away with that? <laughs> it's like, it was just funny. It was. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that we didn't get to do more of those. I know they're so cool. Go spun your neck. Next. Um. That's, oh, so this one's from uh, Waveform to William. What is your favorite microphone to use in vocals? Yeah, that's uh, a good question. Uh, it is the AKG C12. I gotta write that down. AKG. 
case. <laughs> of course, it's probably more expensive than my whole paycheck. For ten grand. <gasps> Jeez. Dude. And then you need That's a like really half good my mic salary. Pre. Yeah, you need a good mic pre and then a good compressor. Uh, Whoa. But, but that's great. Uh, you know what a great microphone that is. Wow. Oh my goodness. Ooh. Yeah. That's they don't make them. Plus, you know, it's a vintage mic. They stopped yeah, making them. Yeah, they stopped making them years ago. ago. Whatever, 30 years ago. The, the, the reissue by AKG, the AKG C12 VR, it's called. It, that's still a great mic, too. It's, uh -huh. it's, it's only like four grand. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Not quite 10. Uh, mm. Four. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you, have like, you gotta have like gold plated vocal cords to use that. I'm looking at mine right now and I love it. Oh, God. I hate you. <laughs> no, that's, I love it. I actually, that's a great I microphone. It. I have other great microphones. I mean, there's, I love microphones. Uh -huh. You collect a bunch, right? Yes, he collects them. I just love them. The old German microphones are so good. I have a pair of uh, Neumann KM84s from the early 70s, wow. and they're sequential serial numbers. Oh, my goodness. So, so I have them mic, they mic my piano so that when you use them, you know, if you want to do a stereo miking, uh -huh. the response since they came off of the line one after another, you know, like mm -hmm. people who are, you know, engineers love to have sequential serial numbers because the characteristics and materials are all consistent from one mic to the next so they sound the same. Wow. That's, that's awesome. And yeah. all the mics, you, how many mics do you have, roughly? Bru I don't know, 20, 25? Oh, cow. That's so cool. Yeah. yeah, but not like Brian Adams' collection in the studio where Daniel Ingram records. I've been up there. Yeah. Good Lord, he has every microphone. I mean, they have cases from floor to ceiling of all the most beautiful microphones from all over the world. Holy cow. Yeah, he, I never, he I never spent every. He probably spent every, uh, every dime from, you know, at least one hit just buying microphones. I don't know. He's got them all. Wow. It's crazy. That is crazy. Um... Uh, this one's from Toon, Toon Geek 45 question for Will. Uh, what is your favorite Weird Al album? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I think they're all great. Uh, I, you know, he sent me his new one, and, and I haven't heard it after. I've just been too busy. Mm -hmm. I, I couldn't say. I, I mean, there's tracks that stand out. I don't know. But they're all, they're all, they're all great. I mean, here, I, I really don't have a favorite. Now, here's the question. Which albums did you actually play on? When did you actually leave the band? Very early on, I played on his very first record. Okay. And I think that was about it. I think I played, no, no, no. I played on another one, two or three records later. Mm -hmm. and, and then some of my stuff was put on best hit records, you know. Yeah. Uh, nice. uh, so, uh, so, you know, it was early on in his career. Actually, I was, I was playing in a punk new wave band with his drummer, Bermuda Schwartz. Oh, okay. And uh, this was before Weird Al even had a band. And one night, uh, you know, when we were playing all those bars and dives on the Sunset Strip, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he went to go jam with Weird Al on the Dr. Domino show. Oh, okay. And he took this accordion box and just beat off, uh, excuse the phrase, but, you know, banging on the box and, mm -hmm. and uh, excuse the phrase, and, uh, and, and made up, they kind of made up another one, Rides the Bus, and performed right. light on the show. Right. And then <laughs> afterwards, uh, he convinced Al to start a band and... You know, because, you know, Bermuda and I were playing together, you know, at, when he was putting together the band, you know, I was invited to audition and perhaps join, and, and, uh, and uh, I, did, I did tour with him and, and play on a couple of those early records, but shortly after that, I, um, you know, it wasn't too much later that I wrote that theme for Biker Mice from Mars, oh, yes. actually, and, and the guy loved it. There wasn't a show. Mm -hmm. He hadn't sold the show, but I wrote that theme just thinking about what Biker Mars, Mice from Mars would be, and they used the theme that I wrote to sell the show, and, you know, I got busy with that, and it became a huge hit, and so, you know, we parted at that point. Wow. That uh, was, uh, the, it, it just reminds me of uh, um, being in school. I was uh, part of what's called creative writing, and we did an entire project on Weird Al, so we've definitely did like every single like when I was in school, all the, all the music that he did, sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I've heard them all, and it's, it's like it's crazy that I never even knew that you were a part of it. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, the band is so good, and he's such a good band leader, and they do so much good stuff, mm -hmm. and they've outlived many of the bands that they parody. And oh, yeah, and, uh, hey, yeah, they did. They were embarking on a huge tour right yeah. now. The, the, the mandatory yeah. tour. Yeah, no, yeah, exactly. Mandatory fun tour. Yeah. And, and my buddy Kimo, uh, the guitar player, Jim West, he goes, God, I'm going to be gone forever. Yeah, it's like they keep adding dates. 
Yeah. I keep I keep looking keep I keep looking at Al's Twitter. It's like date added, date added, date added, date added. They're gonna do a like you know a Metallica run for two and a half years. You know, yeah. They're gonna be on the road for two and a half years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah. Ooh, so this one, uh, there's a lot of these ones to ask about your favorites. <laughs> uh, but this one's from Pony8962. Uh, uh, I guess this is to all. What is your favorite movie score? Ah, well, um, everybody, I think I, I gave mine out earlier, which is the Conan the Barbarian movie score. Yep. I love that thing. I can, I can listen to that on a loop forever. Love it. Fudge. It's mm-hmm. it's there's so many great scores. Well, mm-hmm. you know, uh, I'm pulling on my iPod. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I loved um, with Hans Zimmer, Klaus Bedelt, Gladiator that he did a very good job in. Um, great score. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also loved um, uh, Gravity. I was actually really shocked with that soundtrack. Um, um, it, it's it's the voice, the the woman singing. Or I don't, I can't remember her name, but the I'm I'm glad that one got last year's uh, um, Oscar nom, uh, Oscar award because I oh there's there's just something about that soundtrack. There's there it's it's really weird and unique, but but it's it, it's just addicting somehow. <laughs> what about you, Will? Uh, I'm I'm completely blank. I'm always I go to see films and I just always go God. This it's almost like all the scores are so good. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I, you know I, I'm I'm just drawing a complete blank. I'm trying to think of the most recent film that I saw that I thought the composer got all of it. Oh, you know what? I thought the use of music in in uh, in uh, um, uh, Birdman was good. I, mm-hmm. I like the choice yeah. of using the jazz drum. Uh, for all those interior sort of Broadway theater shots, you know, yeah. it just just felt Bob Mackie. It felt like theater. It it helped play the atmosphere and theme real well. He couldn't be nominated for an Academy Award because there was too much other music that was uh, dropped in that was you know classical yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that was a uh, th- that was a good uh, you know. It's funny. I, it's it's hard to say that it's a score, but it was a great choice for music. You know, you know the one that 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 surprises me that I really like. Fifth Element. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, who who did that again? I don't remember, but I just whenever I watch Fifth Element, again. it's like I'm in. I watch that movie. I'm in that movie. I'm not. There's no point in that movie where I'm not in it. And yeah, that's the music. Yeah, that was the, a, that was the one with a uh, um, a Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis. Oh, yep. Yep. Yeah. Uh, um. Yeah. I can't remember the girl's name, but uh, but that was that, that was a yeah. good sci-fi movie. Yeah. It um, was Lilo Dallas Multipath. There, there's one other movie that actually uh, always rings a bell to me, um, uh, A Beautiful Mind. James Horner knocked that one out of the park. It's so lively and happy, but at the same time really dark and gritty. I don't know how to describe it, but mm. the piano, the, whoever the piano player is, is, is just so good. <laughs> yeah. Eric Sherrod did The Fifth Element. Ah, there you go. Score. Okay. Yeah, that was a great score. That's a great score. Next. Uh, let's see. Yeah. I could talk with you guys for hours on the scores. <laughs> it's just such a passion of mine. Um, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to... Um, what? Let, I, I, I'm, try, I'm trying to see how to put this. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm gonna, I'll put uh, from Red Card for William. Um, do you... Th- uh, who, who do you think... Uh, uh, I'll just put it as he says it. Do you think Hans Zimmer or other composers would be interested in collaborating in scores in My Little Pony? <laughs> uh, uh, you know, Hans Zimmer can do whatever he wants for yeah. as ever as long as he wants. Uh, if he wanted to, who wouldn't want him to have right for My Little Pony? Uh, um, uh, I don't know. Hans Zimmer writes Henny of the Hills. I can see it now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like uh, below his pay grade. It's way say. below his pay grade, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Way uh, below his pay grade. He, he has quite the uh, yeah. he has quite the following name on him. So yeah. I, I don't I don't think you get him in the room with less than like six zeros on the check. You know, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know what his creative fee is, but yeah, it's but not it's, happening. Yeah, it's, it's not happening. He's more for the action explosions and stuff. Um, 
Let's see here. Uh, oh no, I already asked that one. Fudge cakes. Um, geez, I'm just losing my mind. Okay, here. Um, I was just reading really slowly today. I was at work and I just got back. Uh, oh, here we go. So this one is from <gasps> James, James Justice! Justice. Now William doesn't know James Justice. James is our resident superhero of the show. Taking on that vile villain, soggy milk. Okay. Keeper of the cornflake. So yes, he needs he needs a a, a heroic, heroic theme. <laughs> there we go. James Justice. <laughs> yes. James Justice. Yes. So uh, what? What amazing plot did James Justice, yes, kick soggy milk in the soggy milks for? This week, I mean, what? I mean, nothing happened. We didn't hear anything in the news about Soggy Milk taking over, like, you know, Fort Knox or anything. So he must be doing his job. So, but now that he has a break from doing that job, let's find out what he wants to know. Um, question for all. Ah, uh, do you have any funny music-related memories that you cherish? Uh, hmm. Uh, Go ahead, Will. I I love. You know, music, when I was a kid, I would listen to records over and over and over again. I remember uh, Broadway scores, Funny Girl or Oklahoma, uh, and, and then later on, Herb Albert and the Tijuana Brass, and then I remember hearing my first Rolling Stones records, and then the Beatles, and then... Um, you know all the you know all the stuff uh, you know the the psychedelic stuff and then jazz fusion and and then uh, punk rock and then and then and then uh, you know kind of like neo punk pop and then uh, you know just being pulled along the the whole way by uh, uh, I always have loved melody and rhythm and and, and harmony and uh, uh, I, I guess. Uh, I remember listening to Mama's and Papa's record just over and over again and thinking how great it was mm -hmm. and uh, and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and then, you know, the Rolling Stones' Sticky Fingers and mm -hmm. and and uh, Excel on Main Street records, you know, I mean, those were just like such non-parallel, like just like decadence, you know, and, and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. How can you just say? I mean, yeah, I no, love so much great music. I think, yeah. I think for me, I think one thing that really happened for me was that I, I went to. I used to live in Tulsa, a long time ago, mm -hmm. and a friend of mine said, "Go to this bar now." He calls me on cell phone. Get, get to this bar. Get to this bar. Go, 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 go. I said, like, "What? Just go." So I jump in my truck and I drive 35 minutes to this bar, and I'm like fourth in line, for this show that nobody says who it is. It's just a show, right? And I don't, I, I trust this guy. I was like, okay, so he shows up, we're like fourth in line, we get our tickets, and as we walk inside, there's a guy selling shirts for Kansas. I'm, yeah. going, I'm going, no. He said, yeah, we get, we're fourth in, we are against the bar stage. I am a foot and a half from the violin player of Kansas for an entire bar show. And I'm looking at my buddy, and we're both drinking beer, and we're looking at each other. How could it get any better? <laughs> you know, and these guys are huge, huge stars, and they were in town to play, you know, the Oklahoma State Fair. And just for giggles, they said, "Hey, let's go play a bar." And somehow my buddy got wind of it, and and we're like a foot from the violin player of, of Kansas. It's, it's it was one of the best concerts I ever saw. It was great. It was it was wonderful. Hey, I have a great rock star story. Yeah, do it. Kind of like yours, except it's writ a little larger. Mm -hmm. So, but I remember um, I was um, my um, I was at, was at the Rolling a Rolling Stones concert about twenty five years ago or so, mm -hmm. and it was actually just after Mick Jagger got divorced from Jerry Hall, like two okay. days later. Yeah, and it was at a big. Uh, it was at. Um, I forget where it was, a big Irvine, you know, mm -hmm. amphitheater, and I was on stage with uh, my my uh, she's uh, my my ex-wife Robin Shaw and Jake Berry, who's their production manager, and there was just the three of us on stage and nobody else in the whole venue because the Stones are a very private, yeah. closed organization, and mm -hmm. 
and nobody screws with them, and they're running tech, and they're doing things, and so I'm standing there talking to Jake and my wife, Robin, and all of a sudden, Mick Jagger walks out on stage, like 20 feet from me, yeah. and sits down at the piano and starts playing and singing blues by himself, wow. and there was four of us in the arena, mm -hmm. and uh, you could tell that it wasn't just him sound checking. He had, you know, I think his marriage had just broken up. He was on the road. He's the hugest rock star in the world. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then Keith Richards and Ronnie Wood and, and um, Charlie Watts came out, and they all just started playing. And there was like, you know, the four of them and the three of us and nobody else. And I was on the stage with wow. them. It was quite, uh, I didn't say a word. That, I wouldn't. Yeah. It's crazy. That's, you know, that's, we, Wow. I'm flab <laughs> for giga acid. It's like wow, that's crazy. Crazy. All right, that's amazing. It. That's amazing, actually. Next. Uh, I don't know what mine is. Um, I guess just uh, memories. Just listening to Billy Joel all the time. <laughs> that was my thing. My dad got me into that, and then it just. Uh, then that's all I ever listened to for a very long time. Crazy. Uh, let's see here. Uh. I'm reading that one wrong. Um, okay. I'm just not prepared <laughs> at all. Uh, okay, so this one's from Waveform uh, to William. Uh, do you do the final mixes of the music on the show? Yeah, we. Uh, well, here's how we prepare the music. Um, uh, yeah, we, we, you know, it has to be mixed and ready to go into post. And then what they do over when they dub... You know, the, the ultimate mix of the dialogue relative to the music and the sound effects and the room tones and all that stuff is done at Dick and Rogers and, you know, with the mixing, a dub, dub engineer is what he's called. Uh, Marcellus is the guy who does it. He does a fabulous job. What I provide to them is a Pro Tools file with all the final music mixes. Uh, and, uh, but those mixes are... Uh, and those are final, and they don't really fiddle around with them too much, but I, but I do have to give them some flexibility. Like if we just have a music bed or a theme or something that's going along, and say Discord is in the episode, and, mm -hmm. and there's a real big weird, like he comes in and does some sort of funny thing and, and disappears and gives a look at somebody, and we really mark that look, and we have something really big on his appearance. It's magical and kind of like oblique. I'll have to put that on a separate stereo stem so that if they want to duck it or, or make it louder, depending on the sound effects and how everything's blending together, they have some control over that. So, you know, we, we provide a final mix in multiple stereo stems that gives them flexibility during the dub stage. How's that for an answer? That is an awesome That's answer. amazing. <laughs> amazing. Wow. Thanks. Sounds so difficult. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is Stems. from Flame Heart. This is from Flameheart Kindle. Um, I'm sure you got asked this a lot, William. Um, what is the difference between what you do and what Stefan Andrews does? I had to re uh, revamp that. I think he does the same thing, doesn't he? Isn't well, he, he doing the score? He, well, he, do, he does orchestral for the songs themselves for Daniel. So what we have to talk about is the difference between doing songs and, or, and underscore, I guess. I think you're right. Yeah, uh, because they're totally different. Uh, I, you know, when it's finished and just as you see it on air, that's when I get the dub and talk to Jason and Jim about, like, what do we do for the score for this? It works with the picture as its final edit. What Daniel and Andrew do, they write the show, the, um, you know, the process of doing animation, the, it gets written, the script gets approved, they record the cast doing the script, and then they do what's called a slugged animatic. They cut the... The, the dialogue to the time of the show and then the storyboard artists lay it all out. They, and then it gets animated, which is a long process. You have to write the songs at the same pre-production moment that you're recording the cast. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, and, and, and so uh, it's, a, it's an entirely different thing. They're not working with film. They don't have picture. They're, you know, uh, Daniel's writing the lyric and the, and the, and the music in, in cahoots with the Amy or um, I'm sorry. Did I go back to the original? Who's the head writer now? Uh, Maggie McCarthy.
Something happened to Okay, the... yeah, here we go. There we go. There we go. Sorry, guys. Don't know what the okay. heck is going on. Oh, it happens. Yeah, internet, you know. Wait, someone else. <laughs> yep, just wait. Internet's. So, yeah, I actually had to stop the stream and start it again. So, sorry about that, gentlemen. That's all right. Let's just move on. We're moving on. Yes. Are we back online yet? Or? We are back online yet. But you know what? Okay. You, know, you, know, you know what caused that? No. Yeah, I know what caused it. That was... That was a signal from Equestria. Equestria Inquirer is trying to get through. They, they were breaking the internet to try and get to me. Hmm. They were. So we're going to play Equestria Inquirer right now. So as soon as we get this back going up here, I'm going to make sure, make sure everybody sees us, Scurry. Is everybody there to see, see us? There we go. We're back. Okay. Wanted to make sure that we were back on the screen. So uh, we're going to go to EQI because they obviously want to be on because they're forcing us off the air. I mean, geez. Hmm. Okay, so we're going to be right back, people. Let me uh, get my thing over here. Thank you, Dusty Cat. This just in. Mod Pie has been hired by the Resource Development Agency to assist in their mining efforts. Turns out that Mod's capabilities at demolishing rocks and burritos is equivalent to a 10,000-pound excavator. Savings protected from using mod instead of heavy equipment range in the millions of bits. After staging numerous experiments that consisted of throwing lots of rocks and burning ducks at her, mod proved capable of demolishing 40 tons of rock and 60 tons of tacos a second, beating a record previously set by headbanging Harry Potty. However, there are those who oppose mod being used as mining equipment. They don't oppose ponies being used to replace heavy machinery, of course. There's nothing wrong with Applejack replacing a jackhammer, or Rainbow Dash replacing a 5 megaton capped Saturn V rocket capable of delivering a thermonuclear payload to Moscow, or Pinkie Pie replacing a toaster oven. What ponies reject is using ponies for strip mining. In an effort to mine gold, platinum, and maple syrup, mining companies plan to set Mod loose on several mountain formations in a plan they call the Big Stone XL Mod Line. Environmentalists claim that more study needs to be performed to see what the Big Stone XL will do to the local wildlife. Princess Luna has shown her support for the mod line and claimed it will create thousands of jobs. But Princess Celestia has not been convinced of its viability. In addition, one group is concerned over the rights of the rocks themselves. Ponies for the Ethical Treatment of Rocks and Alkalines, or Petra, have challenged the practice of mining in general and claimed that if Mod really liked the rocks, she'd treat them as fair and equal. Mod replied, and we quote, I like to break rocks. They pay me to break rocks. I cannot contain my excitement. I'm Joe Stevens, and this has been a news brief from the Equestrian Enquirer. Back to you, Dusty Cat. And we're back. And that was, of course, Equestrian Enquirer straight from the desk in Ponyville. Joe Stevens once again bringing us the hard-hitting political news from Equestria. Can you believe it? They're trying to force that Mod XL pipeline straight through. You know, it's crazy. You know, they're just gonna they're gonna have Mod break all these rocks. The hippies want don't want the rocks broken. The rocks have feelings in Equestria. I mean, you just, <laughs> you can't just go around breaking rocks, Mod. I'm telling you. So, yes. But every every show we've got the hard-hitting news. From Equestria with Joe Stevens, Equestria Inquirer, so don't miss a show. Um, even though he's trying to bump us off the air to get it. Have to talk to that boy. Talk to that boy. And we're back. We've only got a few minutes left, so let's make them good there, Scurry. Okay, let me uh, grab out this bugger. Uh, here we go. So this one is from um, uh, Marge Online. He just wants to say, Hey, everyone, first off, I want to say thank you to you, William, for the truly amazing work. Music has always been a big part of the reason I've enjoyed My Little Pony so much. Touching emotions for me that very few shows or movies ever have. A uh, question from Marjan is, is there a particular piece you've worked on that you're most proud of in this or any other series? Uh, one of my favorite things I ever did was a, was the theme for Earthworm Jim. Yeah. And the very first theme that I wrote, the theme for Biker Mice from Mars, I think I got all of that also. Mm -hmm. um, in My Little Pony, um, there's this actually... Uh, I'm doing a show for episode, uh, uh, a long instrumental piece for episode 100 that I can't really talk about, but that's, 
I mean, I've written it. It hasn't been on the air. It hasn't finished the episode. Yes. But yes. It's a favorite thing that I've done yes. out of 100 episodes, and it'll be in episode 100. It'll be in episode 100 coming up soon. Yeah. I know about it. I can't say anything. You do. Yeah. I do know about it, but I can't say a word. It's amazing. It's amazing. I can't tell you anything about it at all. It, no, I can't. It's awesome, though. You're going to love it. Just be, be excited. Be excited be for episode one. Be excited for episode 100. You know, our episode, our episode 100 is coming up soon, too. So. Yeah. Really? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yep. yep. Right during BabsCon, episode 100. Just, we still have to talk about that. We do. Show. We have to talk about that to show is what we're going to do, but it'll be awesome. Next. Hey, I will say one other thing. Yes. Uh, you know the Equestor Girls movie, the, yes. the first one where Sunset Simmer, Shimmer, at the end of the movie, I love the opening to that. Yeah. But also the scene where she runs, uh, where Twilight's going to get her crown, mm-hmm. uh, and the winner is, is what I call that scene. And it runs from there to when Spike is kidnapped, and yep. they run outside, and they chase outside, and she does this big transformation into the huge de- Oh, yes. yes. Uh, you know, that's like a six-minute cue. Wow. And it's, it's, it's pretty darn good writing period i don't care who you are mm-hmm. uh uh feature or otherwise i mean that's that's some pretty darn good score um so that's one of my favorite pieces awesome awesome yep let's see yeah uh oh, this, one, this is from who delicious um, you, william so this this one uh, i even want to know this one um do you ever catch the Easter eggs in My Little Pony and make rem- reminiscent scores to match, such as an example of the Big Lebowski Easter egg? I understand what they're saying. Are they are, by Easter egg is, is East, oh yeah, Easter egg means like so, something that's that's hidden within yeah. the show. Like for example, they had a bowling alley scene where you could see the Big Lebowski. Big characters. Lebowski guys. Have, yes. you ever, have you ever referenced in your own scoring with maybe a. Uh, uh, sort of a background thing that you've noticed well look we used to do that more Mm -hmm. in season two yeah and i ultimately started pulling away from aping Mm -hmm. the filmic references within the show uh because i felt i i liked it at first and it became like oh gee let's do this but then i kind of felt Okay, I'm just going to be honest. I felt like it was a cheap shot and like it too mm-hmm. easy. Okay. And I, yeah. like my job as a composer mm-hmm. was to come up with a fabric and a sound and themes yes. and a feeling for the show that was consistent and was more about the show. Mm-hmm. It's not about a bunch of stylized winks and references to other little other movies yes. or, or, or scenes. Mm-hmm. And, and so my... Uh, uh, after, epi- after, after season two, I started purposely like, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. Okay. And, and that's, that you as an artist, you know, have every, you know, want to do that. I, I mean, never liked doing it. And there you I'm go. I'm thinking about doing it in this week's episode mm-hmm. uh, because I'm looking at it and I'm going, okay, this is basically a scene from Miyazaka, Spirited Away. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, I love that movie! And, and, oh! I don't know how you pronounce his last name. Joe Hi- Hiaishi, the yeah. guy who's done all Miyazaki's films. Uh-huh. He's one of my favorite composers. Okay. That goes, that's an answer to a way earlier question. Anyway, I was going, you know what? This, that was such a beautiful movie. Yeah. And, but and that, the, but that, would be, that would be more than an homage. Yeah, exactly. I'm thinking, yeah. of like, you know what? This guy, I mean, it's less than, than a, a wink and more like me bowing down. Yeah, there you go. It's more of an homage yeah, than, than throwing in a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah, I'm thinking of doing it actually this week. Do it. Do it. Oh my goodness. You're, that we have, some, we have something it. to look forward to. Yes. Yes. Do it. Well, I, I always look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know what? Screwball, we're there. We're there. We're at the end. You know what? Can I say something? You can yeah. say something, but yes. we're, we're going to have you do one thing before you can say something. Okay, good. Okay, so you now get to ask me and Screwball a question. How did the hour and a half go by so quickly? Because we're having a great <laughs> fun time. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> this, is, this is how interviews are supposed to go. It's like, is it over already? We're having an awesome time. When you told me it was an hour and a half, I just, my heart sunk and I went, oh my God. And, and I can't believe it's over. I can't believe it's over either. I mean, we're having such a great time. It's awesome. I don't have any questions. You guys, you know. Okay, I, I, you go ahead and say what you'd like to say. Nothing. You guys rock. Thank you for oh. having me on the show. I'm honored. Well, and, awesome. And okay. Glad. Awesome. So, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to talk about a couple of things here. What we're going to do is we're going to take this off the screen, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys our new t-shirt design 
That was done by Sipsy right here, maybe. So if you go over to redbubble.com and look up the word Stay Brony, that's one word, Stay Brony, you'll find all of our designs, including this new one by Sipsy. You know how, you know how awesome this is? Because even our past guests buy this shirt. There is Amy Keating Rogers wearing this very shirt right now. So if it's good enough for Amy Keating Rogers, it's good enough for you, isn't it? <laughs> I think so. So you should go over to redbubble.com and get this shirt. I'd love to see you wearing it out there. I'll even sign it. Screwball will sign it. We'd love to see you wearing it and supporting the show. Thank you very much out there. And with that, I want to thank Will, of course, for taking time out of his busy schedule for coming and talking with us. Absolutely. My pleasure. Absolutely. Screwball for doing everything he does, getting home from work, coming on talking and doing his thing. Amy, my wonderful girlfriend who comes home and gives me sugar. Nice. You know, at the show. Lance, Bubula, who does everything. I, we couldn't do this show without him. Um, Nathan, roommate, uh, Bash Script, who runs uh, everything over at Canterlot Hill. Everyone who's working at Canterlot Hill for giving us a home and a place to go. Um, and everybody working on FIM. Everybody. MLP, FIM, everybody over there, from, from Will to the people animating the show to everybody doing everything that they do, thank you very much. And to you out there who come, and every time we turn that camera on make fools out of ourselves, you sit there and you watch it every time. I love you. I do. I do. Next guest, Screwball. Yo. You know who the next guest is? Uh, uh. <laughs> I, you I didn't cheat. You didn't so cheat this week, did I, you? I didn't cheat because I'm trying, I'm trying to remember. There's like so many that I know that are coming up. I can't yeah, remember yeah, which orders yeah, and which. Yeah, yeah. Who? I, I don't know. Marika. Okay, yeah. Uh, Marika's going to be here. We're going to talk Gilda. We're going to talk Equestria Girls, Rainbow Rocks, Sonata Dusk, and Tacos. We're going to talk tacos <laughs> in two weeks with Marika. And with that, we're out of here. We love you guys. So, you know what? Got anything, any last thing to say there, Will? Is it okay if I go have a cocktail now? Absolutely. Can I go? Oh, you're too far away, but if you were in my town, I'd, I'd, I'd make you one right now. Make you one right now. You wine, whatever you wanted. Dude, I, you know what? I'll come down in a couple of weeks, and me, you, and Haber will go get it on. Whenever you're here. Okay, bud. With, that, right. with that, we're out of here. Take care. Take care, everybody. Bye. Du, 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 du. Good, Good night, night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. We hate to leave you, but we'll be back soon. Good night, sweetheart. Good night. Good night, sweetheart. Good night.